I'm Dr. Larry Dean, the director of the Regional Heart Center at UW Medicine. I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds this morning. And it's indeed a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, is Dr. Nahush Mokadam. Uh, Dr. Mokadam is an ass assistant professor of surgery in the uh, School of Medicine at the University of Washington. And he is the surgical director of our heart transplant and mechanical circulatory support uh, group at the University of Washington Medical Center. And the topic of his presentation this morning is current status of ventricular assist devices for chronic heart failure. Dr. Mokadam. Thank you, Dr. Dean. This is a complicated topic, and I'd like to start with introducing some background. The epidemiology, uh, epidemiology of heart failure is complicated. There are more than a million hospital discharges in 2003 with a primary diagnosis of heart failure. An additional 2 million people, for a total of 3 million people, were discharged in 2003 with a diagnosis of heart failure uh, within their admission. In 2006, statistics indicate that $15.4 billion were spent on heart failure care. It's estimated that up to 500,000 people currently have refractory advanced heart failure in the United States with an estimated survival of less than one year, uh, uh, a one-year survival of less than 50%. Heart transplantation has remained the gold standard for the care of these patients. However, only about 2,300 organs are available for transplantation every year, leading to a pretty significant shortfall. When we examine the heart transplant statistics at the University of Washington, we've had an excellent track record. Looking at this graph, the black line represents the survival of heart transplantations across the country over the last 10 years. Our statistics are superior for transplantation. And you can see the green line is our most recent patient group, demonstrating a survival of uh, nearly 80% at seven and a half years compared to the national t statistic, which is about 65%. And although this is excellent, and we're proud of these results, there is still a shortfall. This is nationwide and, in fact, worldwide. The number of transplants in the, in the world have been going down, and the incidence of transplants per patient population has been going down. And these are our patients. This is what cardiomyopathy looks like. This is, these are two views of an echocardiogram with a gentleman with cardiomyopathy. The heart is enlarged, it's not beating well, and therefore not providing adequate blood flow to this patient. Pathophysiology of heart failure is awfully complex. This is a diagram that demonstrates all of the factors that are in play for heart failure patients. Medical therapy continues to improve. There are many things that we can do to alter the milieu of the patient with heart failure. Where I come in, or where, where folks like me come in, is at the end. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to skip to the end, because we could talk for hours on the, ma uh, the management of patients with heart failure. But what I'm here to talk about is what we do at the very end of the day. What is a ventricular assist device? Well, this is a mechanical device that supports ventricular function by removing blood from one cardiac chamber and propelling it forward by a variety of different mechanisms. It can be used for right-sided heart failure or left-sided heart failure. It can be considered temporary or what we call permanent. And it can be used in a variety of clinical situations. VADs, what we call ventricular assist devices, are generally used for four principal functions. They can be used for what we call a bridge to reevaluation. Let's see if we can reevaluate this patient after we control a set of unpredictable circumstances. Let's see if we can recover this patient who has a temporary or at least short-term cause for their heart failure. We can say that we plan on transplanting this patient, but we're not going to get them there unless we place this ventricular assist device. Or we can use it for what we call destination therapy or permanent VAT support, meaning this patient's not a transplant candidate, but still has refractory heart failure that's limiting their life. The criteria for mechanical support, or for VADs, was actually developed in the 70s. And it turns out that our criteria haven't changed much in the last 30 years. Basically, we use ventricular assist devices for a failing heart. Now, it turns out that we have a lot of other tricks in our, in our bag that can extend these people's lives to the point where they need a VAD 
but early on and, and even now, low cardiac index, which means how well the heart's pumping, high filling pressures, meaning the heart's getting backed up with blood or the lungs are getting backed up with blood, the kidneys are failing, the blood pressure's low, requirement to need special drugs to keep the heart going called inotropes. If these things are happening, we need to be considering a VAD. There are, of course, patients who aren't VAD candidates, unfortunately, and those are the ones that have major irreversible neurologic changes like a big stroke or have severe liver disease, either as a result of or independent of their heart failure. Other organs that have, end, uh, that have dysfunction that is not reversible, except possibly the kidneys. Significant changes in the heart, like shunts, if they have active infections, if they have high ventilatory requirements, if they're morbidly obese, pregnant, or have had a heart transplant, and most importantly, in some cases, whether or not they have the psychosocial network to support them through their heart failure care. I'd like to run through several types of VADs that we use uh, to illustrate some of the points on when we use them and how we use them. The centrifugal pump was the first VAD, really. It's the same pump that we use in cardiopulmonary bypass circuits to do open heart surgery every day. Unfortunately, these pumps are quirky. They're sensitive to air and outflow resistance, and they don't typically work very well or for very long. But they're versatile. We can use them on the right side, the left side, or if necessary, on both sides. These can be managed with patients with chests that we have to leave open temporarily to support them. It's most commonly used in patients who, after heart surgery, their heart fails, and we can support them temporarily. The centrifugal pump concept was extended to a percutaneous approach that's called the tandem heart. And it's done either by uh, inserting a wire uh, into the artery and vein uh, or by cutting down upon this artery and vein and extending catheters through the artery and vein into the great vessels and into the heart. This can provide up to four liters of flow a minute, which is nearly adequate blood flow for most individuals as normal as five liters per minute. It can be left in for days to weeks and can also be used for high-risk percutaneous interventions, which is actually where we use it most commonly. We have used it for cardiogenic shock or decompensated heart failure and is very effective for short-term support. Newer technology exists called the Abiomed Impella, which is a percutaneous transaortic VAD. That means this VAD goes in through the aorta, as you can see in this video, crosses the aortic valve, pulls blood out of the left ventricle, and pumps blood into the aorta. This is available in two and a half and five liter devices. Currently in the United States, only the two and a half liter device is approved. But worldwide, more than 1,100 implants have been performed. This is a temporary device also, last days to weeks, and most recently was approved in the United States uh, in June of 08. The Abiomed AV5000 is what we call a paracorporeal device. That means it sits outside the body and is connected to the heart. This is also used for more temporary support, ideally less than 30 days, but is very versatile and very easy to use. It can be used for both sides, right, left, and can be used most commonly for a bridge to recovery, and less commonly, uh, at least in our experience, as a bridge to transplant. This device works extraordinarily well, uh, and, and in many cases is a workhorse for our care. The HeartMate XVE and its immediate predecessors was really, was really the workhorse of the LVAD industry for the last 10 years. This device really set the standard for all devices to follow. It has textured surfaces which minimize thromboembolic events called, called strokes and requires little anticoagulation therapy. It can support up to 10 liters a minute, twice a normal cardiac output, but has tissue valves obtained from pigs that are subject to degradation. It requires a large body size because it's a large pump and lasts up to about two years and, in fact, is the only device in the United States that's FDA approved for destination therapy. The Thoratec IVAD is another pump that we use frequently. It's similar to the Abiomed AB5000 in that it's a very versatile pump with biventricular support, but it can be implanted and left in permanently in the body and, therefore, is even more useful in certain circumstances. It can also be used as a bridge to recovery or a bridge to transplant.
The Heart May II has re received a lot of attention in both the lay press and in medical literature over the last couple of years. This is called an axial flow pump. That means that the blood comes in one side of the device, goes through the device, and comes out the other side of the device. It does require blood thinning and a coagulation and can also support up to 10 liters per minute. There is a theory that the placement of this device on the left side can make the right ventricular function worse. This device is currently approved for bridge to transplantation therapy by the FDA and the trial for destination therapy is nearing completion. Another device is called the Ventricore Ventricist. Uh, this has received approval uh, in Europe and in Australia. And the pivotal trial for both bridge to transplantation and destination therapy is underway in the United States. More than 400 implants have been done worldwide and we performed our first implant at the University of Washington in January of 2009. As you can see, this device is also pretty small and is what we call a third generation device as it has blood lubricated, partially magnetic levitation technology. I'd like to go through some data uh, supporting the use of LVADs in a variety of patients and there's two studies I'd like to review. The first is, uh, was published in 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine called the use of a uh, continuous flow device in patients awaiting heart transplantation. This was the result of the HeartMate II pivotal trial that led to its approval. What was found that uh, by using this device is that patients who were supported by this device, 75% of the time underwent heart transplantation or had ongoing support at six months of time. In less than six months, only 19% of patients passed away compared to what we would expect in this patient population is greater than 50%. And even after transplantation, 94% of patients were alive. This was a tremendously successful study and was the basis for the FDA approval. In fact, the device was so successful that four patients removed themselves from the transplant list. They were so happy with the device that they chose to remove themselves. Five patients required temporary right ventricular support, which is actually consistent with previous literature on rate of right ventricular support after left ventricular assist device. And the vast majority of patients were in class one or two heart failure compared to class three or four, which is what they were when they started. Their quality of life questionnaire also drew, revealed a dramatic improvement. Also like to talk about destination therapy. This is based on what's called the rematch trial. A rematch is an acronym for the Randomized Evaluation of Mechanical Assistance for the Treatment of Congestive Heart Failure. This trial uh, was a cooperative agreement among, uh, with the company Thoratec, the NIH, and Columbia University, and was a multi-center trial that enrolled 129 patients. Patients were randomized to either optimal medical therapy of the time or getting the HeartMate VE, which is the XVE predecessor, LVAD. What was found in this study, which was published in 2001, was that one year survival with an LVAD was 28% versus 20, uh, 51%, I'm sorry, versus 28% with optimal medical therapy. That was a statistically significant improvement. At two years, 27% 27 of patients were alive with an LVAD versus only 10% with optimal medical therapy. This is consistent with what we've seen with the, with the efficacy of medical therapy in this patient population. Further, patients live longer, as we see, median of 408 days with an LVAD versus 150 days for medical therapy. Rematch trial was a proof of concept. VADs have gotten better, but medical therapy has also gotten better, and ongoing trials continue to reevaluate it. Currently, Medicare requires Joint Commission disease-specific certification for a center to be able to perform destination therapy. In fact, HeartMate II in its ongoing destination therapy trial has outstanding results and in fact what had previously been a randomized trial is now no longer randomized and is just evaluating the efficacy of the HeartMate II. Other trials are expected to follow suit as this has been a resounding success. But LVADs are not so simple. There are complications. There are bleeding complications. This is open heart surgery and major surgery. 
And it's particularly problematic in patients who are undergoing transplantation because every time we give a, a transfusion to a pre-transplant patient, it decreases their likelihood of receiving a matched organ. Right heart failure does occur in 10 to 20% of patients. There are events such as strokes and can occur in up to 30% of patients, though this seems to be getting better with newer generation devices. Infection can be a problem. This is a foreign body implanted in the body and has a drive line piercing through the skin to batteries and controllers. And that can lead to infection in up to 30 to 40% of patients. And of course, the heart transplantation operation becomes technically more difficult as it's now a reoperation and has a device to remove along with the patient's native heart. Well, at the University of Washington, in over 10 years, we've performed more than 145 VADs. 109 of them were as a bridge to transplant. These data are now about six months old. We had a greater than 90% 30-day survival. And 88% of our patients survived a transplant or had ongoing support at six months compared to the national recent publication of 75% in the HeartMate 2 study. Again, a statistically significant improvement. When we examined our patients to see how they did after transplantation, they in fact did extraordinarily well. And you can see that at 30 days, one year, five years, and 10 years, our survival was 60% after transplantation. That can be compared to the national transplantation statistics of 50% at 10 years. Again, superior. Uh, and we are quite proud of those results. This is not a solo project. This was a multidisciplinary care team. It involves a surgeon, VAD coordinators, heart failure cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, CT anesthesiologists that understand this physiology, perfusionists, social workers, nutritionists, echocardiographers who understand how to evaluate these VADs, transplant coordinators, and of course, the local EMS who needs to support these patients once they leave the hospital. UWMC recently received uh, the Joint Commission certification as a center of excellence for VAD therapy in 2009 uh, as a result of our excellent results and experience. I'd like to go through two case studies to illustrate the use of VADs in the current population. The first is a 47-year-old who presented with a flu-like illness. He presented to a local emergency room, which revealed evidence of hypoperfusion and low blood pressure with cool extremities. He was transferred rapidly to a cardiologist at a second facility, where evaluation revealed that the patient was in cardiogenic shock and multisystem organ failure. He had an intraaortic balloon pump placed and was transferred to the University of Washington for further care. Here's his echocardiogram. Again, his heart is dilated and non-functioning. The right ventricle is also dilated and non-functioning. This patient was an extremis. I took him immediately to the operating room from our own emergency room and placed an Abium at AV5000. As I previously described, this is a paracorporeal device. I fortunately was able to use just a left ventricular cyst device in this patient and supported him with it. His echocardiogram on Abiomed AB5000 support showed that his ventricle was once again contracting once it was unloaded. Once the work of heart beating was removed, this ventricle was allowed to recover. A biopsy of his ventricle revealed myocarditis, which means inflammation of the heart, without enormous infiltrate or necrosis, meaning that it was just sick. It wasn't dead. He was started on steroids. And he was supported for two weeks with an open chest with this device in place. I was able to successfully remove the device on day 14, and the patient was ultimately discharged home. He returned to clinic several months later, where an ultrasound revealed that his heart had completely recovered and he was doing well at home. Another patient is a 24-year-old who presented to a referring hospital with a four-month history of abdominal pain. He was diagnosed with acalculus cholecystitis, that means gallbladder disease without evidence of gallstones. He was also noted, incidentally, to have severe heart failure with a low ejection fraction of less than 10%. He nonetheless underwent a removal of his gallbladder, but had complications, most likely related to his 
heart failure and overall sickness and developed an infection in his belly. He was transferred to the University of Washington for further care. This is his ultrasound. Again, they all look the same, don't they? The heart's not beating. It's dilated. This is the patient population that we see. And despite intra-aortic balloon pump placement and high-dose inotrope therapy, which means heart support medicine, his heart really didn't get better. He was really struggling. Unfortunately, the infection in his belly made him not a candidate for an assist device. And so he was managed with a balloon pump and maximal medical therapy over two months while this infection resolved. Ultimately, it did resolve, and I took him to the operating room and performed a HeartMate II implant. And I have some operative photos here of the implant. In this image, a core is made in the heart, and a, a sleeve is placed so that I can attach the HeartMate II assist device into the heart. I connect that to a tube to his aorta, and then reconstruct his pericardium so that when I have to remove this device, I can get to it easily and safely. This is his ultrasound with the heart made too. Heart hasn't recovered. It's still not beating. But the device is now in place, sucking blood out of his heart and supporting his, uh, blood, his uh, body's perfusion. This gentleman was fortunately our 500th transplant at the University of Washington. And he was doing well at home now after discharge on post-operative day eight. He's really a success story. Where do we go from here? The heartware is a miniature implantable LVAD. It's blood lubricated and is under US feasibility trials. You can imagine the, the appeal of a small device like this. So-called magnetic levitation devices that have absolutely no contact points, such as the Levacor and the Dura Heart, are in, are in trials right now. The total artificial heart is a whole other topic. This technology hasn't really progressed over the last 30 to 40 years, but we hope we'll make some strides as newer devices come out. What about biologic VADs? In rats, a tissue matrix of collagen and cultured heart cells were slipped over hearts and were found to have contractile properties and restraint of the ventricle. Perhaps there's a future in this technology. Of course, the controversial topic of adult stem cells uh, is always uh, on, the, uh, on the docket, and uh, we're involved in stem cell trials at the University of Washington. Where these will go and how we'll get there is, uh, is anyone's guess. I'd like to conclude with the following few comments. Ventricular assist devices are an excellent option for patients with both acute and decompensated chronic heart failure. They require a multidisciplinary care team for complex decision making delivery of therapy, and ongoing patient care. Ventricular assist devices, when util utilized appropriately, can have outstanding results, as I hope I've shown you. These devices are complex. They continue to evolve and have game-changing mini miniaturization and technological advances. This concludes my, my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention and for watching UW Medicine Grand Rounds.